What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief for Front Office Sports, and we are back this week. We have on Rashad Jennings, former NFL player. He's doing a lot of things in business and entertainment, and he hosts a podcast with Lindsey McCormick, a broadcaster who has done work on Sunday Night Football, a bunch of other networks and streaming services. They both are just really into the sports business space in way that we are they have a podcast called the bag and they get into the media rights into the team ownership sports betting and nil so you know really nice to to link up with you know some fellow journalists podcasters and just just talk about the landscape right now um but also learn a little bit about them in the process so we're gonna go Hear a quick message from our partners at Oracle NetSuite, and then we'll be right back. This is it, the putt to win the tournament. And if you sink it, the championship is yours, but you don't. On the back swing, your hat falls over your eyes, you can't see anything. Sound familiar? Is this how you're running your business? Poor visibility because you're still relying on spreadsheets and outdated finance software. To see the full picture, you need to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is number one cloud financial system. It's going to give you a full picture of your business with that type of visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and much more. You're really going to get everything you need in one place. You can automate manual processes. You can close your books faster than you ever have. And all of this is going to help you stay well, well ahead of your competition. In fact, 93% of survey businesses increase their visibility and control after upgrading to NetSuite. Over 31,000 businesses already use NetSuite, and this summer, not too much time left, but you should get moving now because NetSuite has a special financing program for those who are ready to upgrade. That's at netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. One more time, head over there. You can get this special one-of-a-kind financing offer. Remember, this is the number one financial system for growing businesses. It could very well change your entire business netsuite.com slash my other passion get over there check it out and see how you take your business to the next level Rashad and Lindsay what's up welcome to the show thank you for having us <laughs> how are we doing where's where's everybody coming from right now <laughs> I'm coming from yeah. go for you, you first Rashad I'm coming straight from the heart that's the best <laughs> place no, man, I'm in Cali, Cali. Right now. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm in California right now LA no, San Diego. Okay, tight. I just feel like everybody on this show is like winds up being, you know, in California at least. But maybe, maybe Lindsay isn't. Oh no, I'm coming from Switzerland. Ooh, <laughs> what is going on in Switzerland? I'm. She's getting a custom made. No, watch. no, I'm on my honeymoon. We are in Lucerne, Switzerland, at the place where Audrey Hepburn and Sophia Loren used to live. And where Audrey Hepburn and her husband got married. Um, wow! Congrats, <laughs> congratulations! Um, Thank you. That's uh, this is a nice little break, I guess. Um, whoa! I, I mean, I just I love traveling. I love Europe. Congratulations on getting married. Um, sounds like a good time. It's. I have not been out of the country since 2016, and so I'm really making the most of this honeymoon, traveling around Europe. And I was we about to been say, to, you must be yeah. hitting like a dozen cities or at least half a dozen or something. Like, wh- <laughs> tell, tell us your plans. We may as well while we're talking. Like, where are you going? So we started out, the, we got married in Paris or just outside of Paris. And then we took a train, which I would not recommend with luggage, to Baden-Baden, Germany, which right. is this weird spa town in the middle of Germany, which is just stunning. And Rashad, you and I can talk about this later, but (laughs) it's like this, the epitome of health and wellness. It's where uh, Mark Twain went to like heal his autoimmune disease back in the day. And they have these, these, um, what is it? Like the water that runs through the, is meant to like heal people. So people would come from far and wide to this little spa town to just bathe in the water. It's crazy. But anyways, I'll- uh, That's awesome. (laughs) It's I love so it. From- <laughs> well, <laughs> I love I love starting off and like what? Let me imagine. Like I was saying, like two or three more cities, countries. So from Germany to Switzerland, Switzerland to Italy, which I have never been to, and then from Italy, I 
think we're going back to France and then from France to New Jersey. All right. <laughs> well, I almost want to like give it up and do like a round of applause. Like uh, nobody has started off an episode so far with uh, travel itinerary, but I like it. You got to, you got to switch things up. So um, you all have a podcast together, the bag. I'm, I'm correct. Right. You launched a couple months ago. How's that? How's that been going? It's been fun. What do you, what do you think Rashad? How's it going for you? It's been a, yeah, it's been a blast. It's fun getting to know, uh, everybody from a business standpoint, um, you know, and also just who they are behind the sport, um, everybody, and and also the business that endeavors that they're involved in. So I've I've been I've been enjoying it. Um, the bag is a double tundra. You got the, the bag as in the money, um, and also uh, the lame is for somebody being in the bag in their bag for us in their skill set and their zone and their element. So trying to uh, absorb some of the secrets of the trays and. <clears throat> some of the successes of how how we can mimic that i think it's important to figure out what people are doing that works and, and copy it yeah I, I love that and it's a perfect time to you know be talking about what's happening in the business of sports you know obviously that's what we do at front office sports i'm wondering with all these just in, insane things happening over the past year two years of course it's always been big business but between some of these recent like you know team ownership transitions like massive media rights contracts sports betting like all that stuff um as people who are talking about it as frequently as i am just curious like what has caught your attention recently what what's been a couple of the moves that's just made you be like okay like wow or at least i'm just like incredibly compelled by how culture and business is developing. For me personally, an, yep. an interview I'm really excited about is we have one of the, that's coming up soon, is we have one of the top high school recruits that, and his dad, both on the show, talking about just the mentality of, of no longer thinking about just where you're going to go and get an education, but now you also have to manage money, manage name, image, and likeness, manage your social media. And it's so much pressure on the parents and there's not really a crash course for that. And athletes for the past few decades never had to, to do any of that. They just focused on where do I want to get an education and play sports and then hopefully one day I'll make it into the pros. And now it's like a completely different ball game. Yeah. I see, you know, like basically whoever's hot in high school, um, you can like see them now, you know, like there's a total accounts dedicated to it. And it's just like really easy for them to a little bit easier for them to bubble up into the national conversation. Of course they have to have the talent, but I have thought about that so many times where I'm like, you know, we, we probably all, at least I'm assuming, you know, obviously Rashad, we know, but like Lindsay, do you play sports too? So I actually grew up being a, uh, not pro, but I was a competitive ballroom dancer and that played tennis. For sure. Does it, does it? Okay. And, totally. Um, and you play tennis and stuff, but I would just say ballroom dancing, like the, the physical intensity of it um, would qualify it. You know, because if we're calling, if we're calling, uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm a gamer, so I don't say this in a bad way, but like, you know, they're esports. I'm like, ballroom dancers certainly do. I think it's sort of the way, like, you know, with NASCAR and increasingly F1. I think there used to be this conversation, like when we were all younger, of like, that's like not an athlete, like, I, th I just think everyone's so aware now that it's not necessarily football, basketball, like anything that just requires intense concentration of your body and your mind, you know, can really qualify. I, I did cheerleading in high school. And I remember the conversation was always, is cheerleading a sport or not? And my answer would be, if you're competing against another team and there's competition involved, then it's a sport. If you're just cheering on someone on the sidelines, then that's not really a sport. Yeah. Well, the reason we got off on that tangent, we were talking about like the, the high school kids and and they're just like always being watched, you know, like we play ball. It was always competitive, um, but they are so aware of their image and like, you know, even like hamming it up for the cameras a little bit because they know 
you know, they have the pressure of, of it being all over Twitter or TikTok or what have you. Like Rashad, as someone who really kind of reached one of the pinnacles of being an athlete, you made it, you went pro, you made it, you know, to the NFL. Um, what do you think of that kind of like pressure and like having the eyes on you? And just how does it compare to, you know, a little bit, ago when you were doing the same thing because you all had pressure you had people watching you had the newspaper taking photos and stuff so it's not like y'all didn't know about having some spot- spotlight but i wonder what you can see as like the major differences uh in that in that come up culture you talking about the pressures from like growing up like high school to college to yeah college? and also just yeah, like the way that they have uh everything because because Lindsay was talking about the interview that she's doing where um you know you have to consider this like youth sports it's younger i think you said high school um who who now has to be conscious of his image and his brand and all this you know on social media right and as someone like gotcha, you who gotcha. can compare and contrast because you came up you know your great high school college you go pro like what do you see as kind of the difference um in how like youth sports and just young athletes go through their journey uh I feel bad for these kids now, honestly, because they are, in comparison, um, ripped away from like childhood, being able to make mistakes mm. and learning from those mistakes, like uh, public opinion and ridicule at at one little thing. Uh, you got in a fight in high school, and now you're ostracized. Is this bad person and you know everybody tweets about it and then you know if you get into a fight in high school and somebody punches you and let's say you lose a fight only people that know that are the people that was around now video cameras the entire world know now you have to deal with that pressure and then the same thing if you drop a ball now it's not only the people that know that was on that field but now the world knows you couldn't catch the game time winning clutch play and now you're known as uh the lack of like yeah you're not clutch and so, like, dealing with all of those cyber thoughts is very difficult, I think, for a young mind. You know, heck, it's a difficult for adults. Watch Twitter. <laughs> they can't even figure out how yeah. to handle this But stuff. it's like it's like so the pros are always as... new at a certain level. Once I make it to a certain level in college and, you know, uh, in pros, like, I'm going to literally be on television. And now you got people who the development stage has become very open to the world. Right. And, and it's this idea that you are a pro when you're not, too. That's just, that's just that you're right. There was a prerequisite in order to get on national TV and ball and be seen by a lot of people. Now you can just do it by, and like I said, attention is the new currency in a lot of different ways, right? And so you could, you could have a kid just, you know, make, they're so schematic about highlights. I, I coach still. Like I teach, I have all these You coach camps. fan c- control football, by the way, right? Yeah, I've done. Yeah, fan control football. I, I I still help out at different camps. Like I'm a teacher by nature, especially with. Okay, the sport. so you were saying you and coach these and you see kids. these kids. Yeah, please finish that. I just wanted to let people know, like you know, you got some some of the stuff you do. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, no problem, man. And um, so as I'm watching these kids go through some of the drills and do seven on sevens and you know uh, do what we're asking them and challenging them, they're more concerned uh, overall about getting a one play highlight and then they feel they're done for the day because it's like I got my post for the day where, you know, in order to succeed on a level, the profession is only 1600 people that could play in the NFL a year. That's small. You have to have something different about you. You've always, as a kid growing up, me, you had to have something different to make it an NFL. And today there, you still, there's gotta be something different. And I see a lot of kids trying to be the same. I, um, I, I'm just like, it, it's, it's interesting. I, I, the whole idea of like the highlight thing, cause you see it, like you can discern from looking at social media, but you as a coach, I'm like, okay, that's hilarious. Cause you have like real perspective. I'm just, I, you know, I'm not, I think I love a lot about what this generation does. We had, um, CJ Stroud on here, like a few episodes ago and like, he's, amazing has like an incredible head on his shoulders was telling me i feel like social media is fake i don't be on there all the time i'm not trying to hate on social media either but i do think 
with these young athletes, like it's important to put in the work and not, and with anything like, you know, I saw anything, anything in life, not getting gassed about it <laughs> too early is going to be beneficial. Cause I even saw something about, it was about like the media business and uh, this executive, he was talking about like building up a media empire and he's like, don't, don't get too excited. Cause some few people on Twitter are saying that like you did something great, like that's cool, but you have a lot to do and that can apply to business certainly can apply to these, uh, these kids you're talking about. I'm s- yeah. If you no, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm so glad when we were in college, we only had Facebook and maybe MySpace with like the top five, but we didn't have to worry about, we, we could live life and make bad decisions and learn from our mistakes and not have to pay the consequences of not getting hired ever again as a result of it. It's a big deal. It's a real big deal. And I have, and I speak to this, um, to that generation so much because I have, I'm an uncle nine times and, uh, the youngest being one of my nephews, I got eight nephews, by the way. Uh, one of my youngest nephews is, is nine and my oldest is 23. Wow. So that age group, I can see vividly and I'm 37. I can see vividly the differences between us all and what we aspire to be and how we allow opinions to affect us. And whether it's coming through socially, um, uh, like in real life socially, and then also on, you know, social media, which is just bots. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, yeah. it's, it's insane. And I, you have to, you have to educate. Um, first, you must learn, then you teach, right? And, and, and one of the best ways to learn is to teach. Teach what you do know. Don't teach what you can assume. And I've been able to learn a lot when it comes to sports and success. Um, I, and, you know, um, my, I want to hear about all that. I'm like, can you please uh, lay all of it out for us? But while we're starting to trend toward the success conversation, because it's like, it's like, all right, every everybody, they said stuff about us when we were kids, right? When we were teens, like it's that cycle. And these kids now are going to look at, the next generation where they calling them gen alpha, which I think is a pretty gangster uh, generation name. Like it's cool. Like alpha, like that's pretty tight. My kids are that. So I'm like, good for y'all. It's a good generation <laughs> name. But um, um, the thing that I give them a lot of credit for and just seriously love. And although NIL can certainly use a little more organization at times, um, I think it's, it's obviously a great thing. It's what college sports has always needed. And I love that these kids are about their business. I love that they know what's up They're They're, you know, they uh, like, there's more of a conversation about ownership, about equity, about reading your contracts. Like, you know, I think, I think there's going to be, less sad stories. I mean, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of myself because things, there's certain realities about life, no matter what year generation, you know, it's just going to be people face things. But I do think that there's just a general better level of awareness and like education about how to move and how to handle business with, uh, you know, what we're seeing right now. Yeah. Well, Lindsay, I've spoke to this though uh, before and I, I have, people have asked me, uh, plenty of times about what I think of players asking, you know, for more money and demanding. I said it's all all of this is happening because of the NFL's. Um, I wouldn't. What would I call it? I'll just say because of the NFL rule changes of forcing athletes to become smarter. This is a result that you get. Aha, we're smarter now because it would used it used to be a point where high school students didn't have to have a GPA of a a number in order to play sports. I was in, I was in that little era for a minute in the NFL guys used to have domestic violence and all kinds of stuff, all kinds of issues, drug problems, galore publicized and nobody really bad at all care. Right. So when you force kids to have a 2.3 in order to play a sport, then all of a sudden they thought it was going to weed out all of the, I guess you would say dumb jocks. Mm -hmm. Right. And now we're going to get in different types of athletes. Well, you did. It's, a, <laughs> it's us. It's the guys, it's the kids that are educated. Um, it's the kids that know how to read contracts because that's what you want. You want the smarter players. That's what you get. Now we demand it more. Yeah. And it's it's sort of like happening across, you know, you see it a little more in music, you know, a little more in sports. Um, 
you know, it's a, it's a cool thing that I think we're all moving toward. And that's, that's why we can, you know, both have podcasts just to talk about business, just to just, you know, there's a lot of interest now. Like, I think, I think that's what's sort of like beautiful about the sports business conversation right now is it's like, it's like critical mass. And it's like, what we're saying is not just some imaginative thing. It's like, people care. People want to, I don't remember growing up and being particularly interested and maybe I was younger, but even with the older, my dad and stuff like that, I just don't remember like conversations about like this person bought this team and ESPN is buying the rights for seven years. Like that just seemed like arbitrary. We were obsessed with sports and that didn't seem, you know, necessarily like in our purview. And now I just think most people, a lot of people are really aware of that. It's weird too, because I don't remember being a fan of sports from a young age. I don't remember caring about the details of someone's contract. And now it seems like people are so interested in dissecting these different contracts and seeing all the, the, the wording and the guaranteed money and everything that, that goes into them. Whereas I don't remember that being a part of the, the sport, even though players were paid well back in the day, but people definitely talked about it, but it's like front street now, you know, it's like super, front street very you know casuals as they would call them like are pretty are familiar with some of the stuff going on you're also seeing like these record contracts too which make for really nice big headlines like every i'm always laughing because i'm like how many historical or record-breaking things do we see from like a dollar amount or like what have you it's like every year something happens um so definitely a ton going on there um nfl in particular is like probably one of the shining examples of this growth that we're talking about like i don't know it gets referenced a lot but like the media rights deals are just crazy like the whole hundred billion 113 billion or whatever um and uh, you know we got nba media rights negotiations like coming up right around the corner you know 24 25 um But I wanted to talk about NFL for a minute because, like, Rashad, you played Lindsay, Sunday Night Football. Like, you all are have worked in and just very closely with the league. And, like, um, over the years, having seen them years ago, the state of the business, having, you know, been familiar with it now, whether it's because you follow the space or you literally work with people, um, what do you think about, like, how the league is evolving? (laughs) <laughs> you got me. Well, that's right. I, I think the league, the league is evolving in a way <laughs> that uh, is 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 good overall. When it comes to, you know what, it's difficult because being in there, I, I love the conversation about players and their intellect and the brand awareness and trying to become better men. The thing that I think the next stage of conversation instead of exploiting uh, players' contracts and their numbers and the amount that they're getting, I think um, to take it another step is looking at ownership's contracts and how much they are only paying out players, still pennies, right? So if I have, if I have personally, let's just pretend, right? I got a hundred bucks, right? And I'm paying all, and I'm paying 50 employees a penny. It's going to be like, man, wow, they're getting a penny. And then I say, I give one person a nickel. It's like, whoa, they got a nickel. This is great. <laughs> right. And guess what? And guess what? Now I got $2,000. So now I pay somebody 10 cents. The 10 cents is crazy. Now I get, now I get $10,000 and I finally give somebody a, a thousand. Oh my gosh, they're going to lose their mind. My point is, if you are still enamored by the players' contracts, what do you think the owners are, are getting? Like, that's that's the that's the conversation that needs to be had. And the players then, I'm telling you, it's the next stage of waking up, I promise you, players are still not getting paid their value. Wow. Okay, <laughs> so, so, but so tell as, me, while we're here, what... What 
what let's like like let's we may as well get specific i can tell you're passionate about this um and you and again you played in a league so you have the insight like what we like dax contract for example like that came out whatever I, f- I forget exactly what it was it was i don't know it wasn't like 175 or 200 it was like those are the type of things that we see in baseball somebody gets 300 million right but but what 300 million is like what do you think are you saying that like a player should get like a billion dollars actually because straight up <laughs> like a star player yeah, should get easily. like a billion dollar contract easily <laughs> Easily. Look, and, and, and it doesn't even make agents. I still don't even understand why agents exist. I don't understand the negotiation side. Why are we ne- like, bro, <laughs> imagine this. Just imagine this for a second. Obviously, it's not the same structure of, of, of business. I'm just just play with it. I got right? you. I'm not comparing apples to oranges, but imagine you got that socks hat yeah. on, right? Imagine going to a uh, a company uh, or going into a business and going into, let's say, um, you know, what was it? Hat yeah, lids. Lids. That's where I got this. Lids. <laughs> the water Boom. tower in Chicago. Great place. All right. How do you know how much? Do you remember how much it um, was? They're like, it's funny because I remember when I first started wearing fitteds in like elementary school and it was like, these are $25, $30. They're like 60 now, you know? Yeah. yeah. 60. So imagine the price is 60. And you go in there, and you're you're trying to negotiate to get it for ten bucks. What they do that? <laughs> in um, the in reason- the NFL or just other sports leagues. <laughs> Bingo! You negotiate right, and what do you negotiate? You negotiate. Well, I'll, you do this for me. I do that for you. The reason why you should let me wear it because I can be a brand holder. I can be a walking billboard. Da, 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 da. You negotiate your way until, you know what? Hey, you're right. I'm going to give this to you for free. So eventually, you know what? I'm going to pay you to do it. That's what an agent only can do is try to negotiate a value that already exists, right? That is part of the reason why players aren't getting paid what they should is because agents actually are in cahoots some of them not all some of them are in cahoots with the ownership of 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 bartering with the players meaning for example i've seen this where an agent i have two two clients agent have two clients and tell tell the owner like listen i cut you i give you i give you both players if you cut a deal with me i can negotiate to my player like say i'm representing lindsay i can convince lindsay that you know, she only can ten million is a lot for her in her market and her right. value. Really, she's worth about thirty. But I am an agent; I could definitely convince her. So it's like cut a cut a, cut a twenty thousand a twenty million dollar deal with me, and I'll convince them that it's only worth ten, and they'll be happy with the ten, but not knowing they're really worth thirty. I didn't. I I cut my middleman out, and I got more money than he said that I was going to get. Why? How is that possible? <laughs> Because people Lamar, like, it's, Lamar it's woke up. Vibe. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people have. Now, guess what? They're going to try to say, oh, you're stupid. You're foolish. Why? Because they have to keep that same mind, that mentality in order to control players. Wow. Listen, I, the players still aren't getting their full value. People think about this so much that what what is the conversation when you talk about the conversation, I guess, is the word of the of the day. But but that was just so apparent with NIL, with college. And I, it's really interesting to me how you're like, dog, this is uh, probably even more of a thing with the greatest athletes in the world in these pro leagues. The idea of value. So, yeah, it is. The idea of value is, is still there, still prevalent and always. Yeah, I was be. about to say, I, I, you know, I don't really see a kumbaya that's going to rectify this. But I do think, you know like being a pessimist doesn't serve anyone in real talk when, when a Lamar situation happens and yeah, we've seen holdouts before, but I think it's, you know, there's also like, there's an awareness of value and it's like this like crazy deal that you're going to get this record breaking deal that you want to offer me is actually not enough, you know, cause Lamar could get paid more than Dak now. I, I, I believe, I think, you know, um, it, but either way, he could get he could get one of the very best contracts in the league, and he's like, mm, I don't think that that is enough. Um, and so that seems like some type of movement forward, and uh, you know the type of like dynamic you're talking about. 
Do you guys see contracts in the league headed more towards Deshaun Watson style contracts where there's fully guaranteed no matter what happens or more like Jimmy G where you have to earn your money and there's more incentives written into the contract. Depends on the agent, honestly, because the agents are making the agents are convincing players to accept the money more than they are fighting for them to get more. The agents are negotiating with the player. Hey, listen, I'm doing you a deal. This is the amount. This is this is your max. They're doing more negotiating with the player than they are trying to get. Is it money. because they don't want to work as hard or why? Why do you think that is? Because in their position, their their middleman position is to make sure that they are in a good relationship with that franchise. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they're trying to be an agent for the rest of their life, not three years, two years, because this player is going to be in and out anyway. So think about this. If you're a boss, if you, right, if you, um, <clears throat> Baker, gave me, if you said, hey, Rashad, I want Lindsay, and I'm going to give you a million bucks. I give her a million dollars. That's it. Get out of my face. Take it or leave it. I'm going to be like, okay, uh, Baker, yeah. I got yep. you. Let me put on Let me put on my agency. Hey, Lindsay, listen, <laughs> got a great deal for you. Got a great deal for you. Now, um, what we're going to do is you're going to take, I got a, I got a million dollars on the table. What we're going to do is play this out. We're going to go in there. You're going to kill it. You're going to do this. I'm going to try to get some incentives. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try, 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 try. But you got the million dollars, all right? Does that sound like a good deal? Actually, if I'm smart, I'm going to tell you I only got $800,000. But I'm going to try to negotiate another two, right, to get to that meal. And then you're going to feel like I'm working, right? I'm not negotiating to try to get you more, Lindsay. I'm trying to convince you I'm working. And you know that this is something that happens. Like, you're not, like, being a conspiracy theorist. You, as a former NFL player, you're like, this is a reality. Play ball. Yes, this is this is what they do. Major- some I've, I can't say all. I will never say all because there are some agents that do a good job. They're, I mean, but we're, we're talking about it. there's always size to everything. But all in all, I have seen this time after time after time after time after time after time. And I was a uh, once I put my name down as my own representation for marketing deals. Verizon, bring what they do is they call the NFLPA. Whoever's on your uh, MRA, whoever represents you, they get that phone call. So let's say, let's say I have an agent, right? Let's play this out again. I have an agent. Baker, you're my agent. Lindsay, you're Verizon. You call the NFLPA. So guess who gets the call? Baker, because his name is down. You're going to tell him, hey, I got a $50,000 deal for Rashad Jennings. He's going to be like, oh, that's my client. Gotcha. He's going to call me, bring. I'm like, yo, what's up, Baker? He's like, Rashad, I'm out here working hard for you. I got your $50,000 deal. He ain't done jack but answer a call. Now I'm going to think he's doing his job, so I'm going to, hey, that's my boy. That's my boy. Right? As soon as I get rid of Baker and put my name down, Lindsay, you're going to call looking for me. Bring. Guess who's going to answer? Me. Hello? Rashad, I got a $50,000 for you. Deal for you. Guess what? I don't have to pay 20% on that no more. Yeah. that. I mean, that alone, the percentage, because, you know, it's um i guess like there's also the there's a reality of i think there's like this decorum thing right that everyone has in mind or just like not wanting to disturb the peace and like i think the agent might be coming from a place of anxiety of like you know let me just get this deal done because i'm in the middle man i need i need to make this happen i don't need the, to spend all the time necessarily but you know agents can be incentivized by getting more money so they get a a bigger piece you know like um like i think i think in reality like most things in life like there's a lot of different situations there's a lot of different um ways that people go but Lindsay, i am curious about you know the broadcasting business and you know what you kind of learned and, and saw doing sunday night football shows that you're like still doing now um at FOS, like a lot of a lot of people are really interested in broadcasting and in anchors and, and you know people calling the games and everything. Uh, one, they add so much to the production. It's important. We need to like fill an experience when we're watching a game. Um, you know, we also like learn to love these people personally. Um, you know, I saw like the inside the NBA guys at TNT just got like the crazy re up contract because. 
Why wouldn't they? Everyone loves it. Yeah. Uh, I'm best, actually really best happy. team in broadcast. I was about to opinion. say, I'm so happy yeah. that they did too, because um, I think everyone's always like, I hope this never ends, you know? So I'm glad we got like another decade uh, in place. They're awesome. <laughs> they really it's like are. So, yeah, it's so entertaining. Um, but what, oh, you know, what, what I was saying is just that people from the FOS, I can see how engaged people are. Like some of our most successful content is, yeah, Malika is hired here and doing the, like all these like different people um, in the business. Like people are really invested in uh, the, you all success, like the development. We like learn to like, you know, we're like friends with you through the TV. And I don't know, you're in that business. I'm always, you know, we're reporting on it. It's a social post. Uh, I, I personally, I'm not always sitting down. Our guy, Mike McCarthy, who is like our media reporter, is it talks to me people all the time. But um, now that I'm in the seat, I'm like, what's up, Lindsay? Like, what what has that journey been like for you? It's in terms of contracts in the broadcast world, they definitely have changed a lot since I first started my goodness, was it like 15 years ago? And now you see more athletes retiring and it's just a natural transition into the booth. And you see the contracts are starting to reflect that. And when I first started, I never thought in a million years, I'm going to make so much money doing this. I just thought this will be a fun career and I am passionate about it and I love it. And if I happen to make money, great. But I probably also need to find a second job or a side hustle to bring in more cash. But now you're seeing guys like Tom Brady sign on for a deal, even though he's still playing and uh, Charles Barkley with his the Aikman new, deal was like 90 he, or a hundred mil with ESPN, like Tony Romo. That was mm -hmm. a wild contract and they're giving them these contracts before truly seeing what they can do on air especially yeah. the Tom Brady one. We don't even know if he's going to be right. Do you think Tom Brady got a test, a, a test episode? Like they're just like, man, take the bag. Yeah. I don't think they, I think maybe Tony Romo, they brought in for a, a test or two and had some meetings with him and realized, Oh, this guy is charismatic. He, he's going to be fantastic. I think they knew they had a special gym with him. Whereas with Tom, I think they're just like banking on the name. And really hoping that he brings a sort of outlook into the booth that not many people have. But this is a long-winded way of saying the contracts have changed drastically. And as a result, broadcasters that started out as either journalists or sideline reporters and are climbing their way the local route, there our contracts have increased as a result because they want to make it fair for everyone in the booth, even though if you're a journalist, you obviously don't have experience playing the game, but, but you put I mean, in that work, you know, you build up yeah. your resume over, over, over years and, you know, studied the game. Like, so that makes sense. Uh, what do you think about, I think like Amazon is kind of interesting in particular, uh, even though everybody else just like signed these big deals too. Like they're all people who have been broadcasting, NFL for a long time. Um, but man, Amazon, I just, I, I can't help but talk about this when we have a broadcasting convo um, because one, they're just like really aggressive in their marketing. I get, I'm getting like packages of toiletries and kids stuff to the house and the whole wrapping is like, you know, <laughs> watch Thursday night, watch Thursday night. You know, they're integrating with Amazon music, all this stuff, but you know, bigger than any of one integration, just like, you know, what do you think of that when you talk about what your pod is about, what this one is about, sports business, all that? It's like got to be one of the most significant developments. Um, like, and they're and they're trying to do more, but they, you know, they just debuted like a format. I think everyone has their thoughts about it. I wonder what you all's thoughts are. So I actually have a little bit of an inside scoop on Amazon because I work for them on a show, and. I think they have a lot of money and they want to be successful and they're willing to use that money to be successful. Um, whether or not that will pan out, I, I I don't know. I think at the end of the day, people truly just want to see the game. They love all the extra things, 
and all the extra commentary, but I think the people that own the rights, and we had a guest on here that was talking about this similar uh, topic that aired on our show last week. And she said the same thing. At the end of the day, the rights to the game will win out over any alternative platforms because people people tune in because they want to watch that particular game. I will say the only exception is I will tune in to watch Inside the NBA, even if I don't care about the teams playing, just because... I've seen people say that. <laughs> that broadcast is so good. Chuck, Shaq, you can't... Right, are you taking defense. notes like as a Brock? I mean, like I was your season, so it's not like you know you're just getting in the game. But but you're always studying, right? You're always yeah. Like 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 I think it, like for instance, Kobe. I was reading Mama Mentality. It's like yeah, he was already a great, and he acts. I just love his audacity. He he would go up to Jordan. He would go up to whatever, and he would know how to talk trash talk. But um, but he was like, I'm going to guys asking for advice. Michael Jordan's trying to trash talk me, and I'm like, Hey, how do how you do this pivot? Like, you know, stuff like that. Um, but but I'm comparing it to someone in your line of work, and then watching people who you think are great broadcasters, and just like how that inspires you, perhaps, especially your so, faves over at TNT. So I, when I first got into the industry. I almost made, I kind of made the mistake of finding my favorite hosts and broadcasters who I loved and trying to emulate them. And what I learned throughout this is like you said, it's, you're watching your friends, you're watching people that you're following their career path, you're following their journey. And they, people that are watching you on television feel like they know you. And that's why they tune in because of your personality and I was trying to be Susie Colber or some of these women that I, I, Alex Flanagan or women that I really looked up to. And I realized that that wasn't going to be successful. That wasn't going to make me successful trying to emulate other broadcasters. You essentially just have to be yourself and the fans will either like you or they won't. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that that has kind of stuck with me. I I, I, I had a job where I was working for Comcast Sportsnet in Portland on a show called The Fan. And it was simulcast on ESPN Radio and on Comcast Sportsnet on the television side. And I, it was very a very challenging show for me at the beginning. And I pray those clips are not somewhere on the internet, which I'm sure they are, because Everything. there was definitely there was definitely a growing period in my career. And it was a very early on in my career. And I think at this point we're, oh gosh, it was like 12, 13 years ago. And I was trying to figure out. What your style was. Yeah. And it was challenging and I almost lost my job because my boss was like, are you sure you're good at this? Like, why did I hire (laughs) you? And over time I realized I just have to, like, you just have to be yourself and people either like you or they don't. and, And companies will either hire you or they won't. And that's really as I've grown in my career and found other broadcasters whom I really respect and love their work, the common thread between all of them is that they are genuinely themselves and fans just love them for that. And that's kind of just been my, my recipe that I've followed. Yeah. I feel like we could all learn a little bit from that. So you know, what uh, What else is just going on uh, in life? Like, you all have this show together. Rashad, you got Verizon calling you. <laughs> like, just, uh, you know, like, what's up? I, I, uh, you know, like, like we talk so much about you know, life after sport and NFL and getting your business right. And you, you explicitly do a show about it. But I would imagine, you know, that's part of your life personally as well. Um and so, you know, what are some of the things that, you know, you're into um, from a business perspective or even just like what your career in the NFL and perhaps some other, uh, you know, successes of yours has like afforded you, you know, you like, you, like, are you really into cars? You traveling? Are you out in Switzerland like Lindsay? <laughs> like, just what do you uh, what do you get into? So there is a, I'm going to start off. By saying this, there is a quote that I don't live by, 
but I live my life in such a way that if somebody was shadowing me, it may encourage them to write down these words. It's the <clears throat> master in art of living shows little distinction between his work and his play, his labor and his leisure, his love and his religion. He simply pursues everything he does with excellence, leaving others to decide, is he working or is he playing? But to him, he is always doing both. I say that because I do so much um, and I'm just having fun. And somehow that turns into finances for me, right? And so, you know, I pick up dancing. I fell in love with dancing and won Dancing with the Stars. I decided to start writing, became a New York Times bestseller. Um, I dedicated my life to becoming a great athlete, went to the NFL. I decided to pick up renovating, uh, learning how to renovate homes. And now working with HGTV on renovating homes. And I, I, I got tired of going on everybody's podcast. Somebody's, and they would always say, hey, you should start your own podcast. We're doing that now. Like, so it's not that I have a particular goal in mind other than it's more so um, affecting people in a positive way is my goal. And I use so many different instruments to sing that music the different cultures, people, uh, places. And so for, for myself, man, I started an esports organization not too long ago uh, just because I was playing video games way too much. And I said, this is really dumb for me to do when I could be doing so many other things. And then somebody said, you ever heard of Twitch? I said, no, looked it up. Boom. Makes sense now. Um, so, you know, then, you know, starting other businesses and companies like I, from a business standpoint, I have I'm doing a lot, but it all comes from the place of me. Where is my fun? And how do I turn fun into sharing? Uh, and then sharing into a profit? Question mark. Is it possible? Then let's do I it. I can't believe the people who like Twitch and YouTube, like like you really can get paid on there. Like there's people who are like, you know what I mean? I a, a friend of mine, um, you know, he's very close with, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily have to name him. He's one of those guys who, uh, you know, millions of people are watching and stuff. But, like, you know, it's like a million a month is, like, not unusual for, you know, one of the, like, top rock, like, Mr. Beast. You know, like, some of this stuff is just, like, it's insane. We've never seen anything like it. Um, and it's cool. Um and I love your philosophy. I love, uh, I love, I love your quote about life. I think, you know, it's definitely not a bad way to live, not a bad outlook to have. You all are yeah, good. Man. I hey, see hey, why you hey, have hey. a podcast. It's fun talking to you all. You have great sounding voices. I'm like, I'm taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> we we taking yeah. notes too, man. We're always, always taking notes. Yeah. Lindsay, um, what about yourself? You know. We obviously established the the wonderful Europe honeymoon right now, um, but you know you've you've been in this for like fifteen years, like you're saying too. So you've seen a lot, you've been through a lot. Um, you know now you're at this point where, you know, I'd love to know just what what you've learned, like what what I think like when I ask these questions, it's coming from a place of like I really feel like first of all, just a lot of us you start having epiphanies in life. You know what I mean? You start hitting, especially like you start hitting like your thirties about like that's where I'm at or, you know, early thirties or I see, you know, I have a lot of friends over the next 15 years. It's not all about age. Like obviously you got to grow and do stuff in your twenties, but I think it just does take an amount of time and amount of experience to start having like real perspective to not be just caught up in the moment. Cause at first you haven't lived that long. Like, you know, like I, I always think about kids and it's like, if you're five years old, like a year feels very long because it's one fifth of your life. Now these years are flying by and we're also able to look at several of them. We're able to like chart our life. Um, and <laughs> I thought Rashad, clearly Rashad is working and playing. That's going to, that's going to carry you pretty well. But, uh, but Lindsay, just like, what do you, what do you do? What do you love? Uh, what have you like kind of discovered about yourself from, from all the kind of work that you've put in? So my twenties were all about work, 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 and trying to 
build a career and figure out what my passion was in life. And sports was it. And as I've gotten into my 30s and gained some perspective, I realized that I didn't have a great work-life balance. I worked myself into an autoimmune disease. And then I got to a place where life was like, you have no choice but to slow down and prioritize your life. And I had to really sit there and think, okay, what does God want me to do in my life? And what do I want the next 10 years to look like career-wise? And what do I really enjoy about sports broadcasting? And for me, the biggest thing was the people I got to work with and the relationships I got to build. And I realized, okay, sports is just a vehicle for that. And so the past, t- uh, let's see, I'm 35, about to be 36. The past six years for me has been finding ways to better connect with others. And sports has kind of always been that middle ground for me. And that's why I genuinely have loved it since I was a little girl. My dad and I would connect over sports and would watch Mm -hmm. the baseball game together and the Astros games. And that for me was... Oh, yeah. You're from Houston. Good. uh, (laughs) Well, you know, like... You, you, you all, I, I, we could do like a whole episode about the Astros, but you, I love Houston people because I'm like, yay, the only people in the country cheering for the Astros. But but yet, you all keep turning up. Like it's it's hitting the point where some of the controversies, it's like, mm, yeah, but they're legitimately like a dynasty. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I got love. I got love for y'all, but we know it's a little bit tense out here. Yeah. So for me, I guess the past 10 years, the thing I've learned the most is that what I genuinely love about the sports world and this career is that sports are a common ground and between everyone. And my mailman loves sports. My Pilates teacher loves sports. My doctors love sports. So it's, it's that it's a one of, of a few things that truly bonds people and helps you build strong relationships. And that has been the work-life balance I have been trying to find is focusing more on working with the people I want to work with. And like Rashad, I love working with Rashad. He's, it literally brightens my day to get to log on to Riverside and, (laughs) see Rashad and talk about the latest things in sports, but then also when the the camera stop, like talk about what's going on in our lives. And so I feel very lucky to, to get to do this for a living. I don't know if the Alps have snow yet, um, (laughs) but I'm like, okay. Cause I'm like, are you going skiing? You know, like you going, what's like, what, what's up? What do you, I guess if you're not skiing, yeah. um, you know, like what, what is something, what are, like you're in Europe right now, you're on like vacation. Like, what is it? Of course, like your, your marriage, you're celebrating, but I'm like, yeah. that's just like fun to be out doing. What are you like? Oh, we got to hit this. We got to do this. Like what's on, what's on the, the itinerary for you and the husband. So for the first day we got here, we took a gondola down to a boat and then took a boat across to <laughs> across to this is the wildest trip I've ever been on. Took a boat across to uh, Lucerne. And then we walked around Lucerne and just explored the city. We just love exploring new cities and new cultures Same. and eating the eating the food. That's really my Why only Why is priority. a new city like like the best feeling in the world? Like it's just it's something about it or just, you know what I mean? Uh, and also just like international stuff, like getting out of your element. It's just like you get, it's almost like you unplug from the matrix and you can just like appreciate being a human. But one thing I always reality check myself with, cause I get like serious, um, like expat, like FOMO type, you know, I'm like, Oh yeah. my God, I need to, I can't ever have a good vacation without being, I'm moving here. I'm next year. Let's you know, I always, <laughs> I always am like trying to plot on moving somewhere just cause I had like a good week there. But how I reality check myself with that is, is the people 
who live there are in the same position. And I, you know, I'm flying back home into New York city or into Los Angeles and they got their phone out the window and they're like, Oh my God. And they're getting their escape. You know, I, yeah. I saw a TikTok where, and like, this is the type of idealism that happens on a good trip. But this, this uh, young woman, she was like, she was like, I'm in Italy right now. Yeah, it was Italy too. So maybe you're yeah. going to see a little of this, but she was, and you're going to do the same thing probably. <laughs> um, but she was <laughs> like, she was like, I'm in Italy. And like, this is just the way to live life. And no one's worried about anything here. They don't care about da 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 da. And I just loved it because the comments were filled with like Italian people and people just being, you know, Europeans being like, what planet are you on? That's not my experience at all. That's not what it's like. I am always working. I need to pay rent. Like, uh, so, you know, it's good. Seeing the world is awesome and like gives you perspective. Like Rashad, do you get out, um, you know, much, especially with your whole like work and play philosophy? Where do you, where do you be at, you know, on this planet? I'm all over the place. Um, uh, I, it was uh, for two years. It was legit. Two years straight, I was in a different city every week. Wow. Um, traveler, uh, just to, and you know, I really, I really got a chance to explore the U.S. in a crazy way through tour busing with Dancing with the Stars, traveling from meeting to meeting to meetings. Um, just you know, I would, I would just travel to Nebraska, get a hotel, and stay there for two or three days. Because I wanted to smell the atmosphere and write, yes. right? And um, <clears throat> philosophy, sociology, psychology, like all of that is my lane and my space. I have a desire to be a marriage counselor in the latter years of my life. And so I'm, I'm really interested in how we relate to people, human to human interaction. I got my do honorary doctor's degree in uh, humanities. And so, like, that's me. Absorbing life, looking, thinking, philosophizing, probably stupid majority of the time. But, like, that's my muse. Right. And I try to stay away from being amused um, quite often. And, um, you know, you know, m being amused is without thought. And a lot of entertainment amuses us. We're not thinking. That's why so much crap can be thrown at our face and we accept it because we're amused. Yeah, it's also a lot, a lot of disposable and stuff that that comes and goes like like I always try to. Like when I talk about the reality check with the like foreign, oh, I'm on vacation. I think sometimes people do that where they're like, you know, we start getting older and it's like every everything is trash. The music is all bad now. But you know what? There was a lot of trash in the 90s on the cassettes on the, you know, there was plenty of stuff that was like record labels pushing some corny agenda and it never cut through and novelty acts and one hit wonders. Although I have a lot of respect for one hit wonders because there's so many good ones. And it's like, if you ever make one song that's as good as some of the one hit wonder songs, it's like, then you did something powerful in the world. Cause it's still on the radio all day. Um, exactly. How is that? How is a one hit? It's wonder not, that? I Why know. Is that a negative I, term? And then if you're smart, like, like some of these people are, just like paid. First of all, they're getting like the Super Bowl commercials 30 years later and stuff. Just saw like the Rick Astley one. Sir Mix a lot owns Baby Got Back. So he's like been set for life. Um, but I remember like somebody, I saw some magazine or some years ago and, and like someone was trying to talk to Rick Astley and be like, how do you feel about being like the Rick role? Does that like your legacy and all that stuff? And, uh, and he was like, I retired at like 20 something, like I'm good. <laughs> you know, he was like, I'm chilling. And then what, what I loved uh, was the re reappraisal. I saw him get, he just had a really, in I forget what brand it was, but it was a pretty clever commercial. And then everyone was like, oh, why have we been trying to deny that never going to give you up and together forever is like a banger, you know, but uh, I don't know how we got on to talking about Rick Astley. Um <laughs> <laughs> music man. hey but music I, I actually dropped an album uh two months ago so that was just something i wanted to try out i got you know i got tired of uh yeah, being on twitch actually and getting some of my content taken down because i have music in the background so i said you know what forget it make my own music got together with some uh, a group of people made an album and it slapped 
There's, Congrats. So there's nothing Rashad can't do. <laughs> That's what I've learned. I know, dog. Super versatile. I, I love what you said about like exploring the US. Um one, what you do, you know, going to Nebraska, locking in writing. I've always had a fantasy of doing that in like Montana, going to like the mm. great big sky, mm. dipping out. Like I don't I, I think there's probably some stuff where I'll be like, mm, you know, this is a little different than I expected. But um I don't know, something about being in like Missoula and like some random place, like in a in a fire, ca- you know, cabin. Like I love things where it's like, okay, I'm still comfortable, but I'm a little bit like in nature type of stuff. So find like a really nice cab. It's like a cabin that's remote, but like it has like nice appliances. You know, it's like clean and great. Like so, I go, nah, but go to something like that for like months and just like get a book done or something like that. Um, and what you said about ne- Nebraska. That's so real because a lot of people would think, okay, why do you want to visit Nebraska or something? It is, it's just nice to see new things. I've seldom ever had a place that I saw, uh, you know, maybe some stuff and not everything's thrilling, but a lot of stuff, the first time, the first and only time I went to Nebraska was in college. I went to Illinois, I was in business school and we had this situation, this program opportunity to go out to Nebraska, go to Berkshire Hathaway hang out with Warren Buffett essentially which was amazing like we you know it was like other schools there was probably like 50 kids or something but you know he took us out to this restaurant went on a little tour toured Berkshire uh got to sit in a room and ask questions and stuff um but I just remember being like really appreciative of that and not just for Warren but for being able to see something new um like I you know never gone through Iowa and it looks like the Shire and all the hills are all rolling and beautiful. And like, I haven't been back since, but I'm glad I saw that, you know, I'm trying to see everything. And with the little time that we have here. I love it, man. Do it, do it. Challenge yourself to do it, man. And, and you know what? I like to challenge you with this. This just sounds crazy, but this will help you. Oh, I wouldn't say help. This will allow you to take a part of, my commentary on life and how I look at life. Uh, next time you open the door, right? Check which hand you're opening the door with. Watch what's natural. Stop yourself and use the opposite hand. Hmm. Then when you're um, when you when you're about to brush your teeth, check what's normal. Use your other hand, right? Do everything the whatever you're about to pick up a fork with. Use the other hand. Whichever foot you you're about to put on your sh- jeans with first. Use the other foot. Do all of these things, and then at night, before you go to sleep, light a candle, cut off the lights, write about everything you did and what you felt. Just do it and watch what it tells you to do next. It's a, it's a way of looking at life, right? See, I, I'm, I'm very interested in learning how people think more so than the filed information they can give me. I'm always curious, like successful people, how do they think what are they looking at differently? I want to see them in real time think, and you'll see yourself start to think. And when you see yourself think, it's very pleasant because you're re- you're. It's like you get this chance to yes. know yourself differently, not just what yes. you are breaking out of patterns, bro. Like doing. breaking out of patterns and being like, like I was on autopilot for some of these decisions. I had so many things that I thought it was just the way things had to be was like my imagination, my own like biases and, you know, things that just like imprinted from childhood that I never kind of grew out of. Like we all have these things and it feels good trying to grow and learn yourself more. Like that's, that's why I've been, I don't really have much, uh, Oh, I'm getting older. Like I'm like loving this time and looking, looking forward to more like, yeah, I love youth. You stay healthy. Plus, Plus, I just don't, I, I just don't believe, like, I see people who are, like, 60. I'm like, you're young. Like, you know, like, I don't really yeah. feel that same. Um, and, of course, some people, you know, we're, are, they're not fortunate enough to make it that. But some people don't make it, you know, to their to their 20s. You know, teenagers and so many cities, uh-huh. violence and stuff. So it's all it's all something to put into perspective. But I do think I'm enjoying this time because... Um, 
you kind of finally start to you will never figure it out the whole like existence of humankind and, and religion and the science and theories is because we're trying to figure something out to understand like why this is all happening um so so i say that to say like we will never totally figure it out but it feels good when you're in your 30s and you start to understand some things you start to like know yourself and not just be reacting you know what I mean? Not just be reacting to everything and uh, actually like, to, have a little more consideration. You start to realize that life is bigger than yourself. Yeah. For sure. 100%. For sure. And in, in a real yeah, way, a in a real way form. too, like you can be younger and be humble and like understand it's bigger than yourself. But, but I think there's like, there's just more perspective that comes with time and you have to like, you know, you're not just trying to figure out uh, like, you know, you're not like just full of hormones and just like, damn, I'm all like, when you think about it, like humans, it's crazy. Like, you'll be like, this human is only, that's what I was saying about like five year olds earlier. I was like a year is like a fifth of your life. You know, it's just, it's just such a different reality than those first moments in life where you get to hit it and say, okay, you know, I got a long way to go, but I do have experience. I've ha I've been up and down. I've made mistakes. I've learned from them. Some I had to make several times, but you know, that's, that's where I'm at. That's what I'm, that's what I'm trying to figure out as a person right now. At, it, uh, finding an elder that, uh, somebody in their sixties that are conscious are the best conversations you possibly can have because like we're all kids growing up and we never yeah. stop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like I me us right now, we can tell a 15 year old, Hey, look, you want to be aware of this, this, that, and the third. And we are conscious, right? You can also find somebody in their 30s that are not conscious and still give 15-year-olds mm -hmm. advice. So we're always getting advice from everybody. It's just what source are you listening to, right? So it's important to find you an elder that has a source of, of, of wisdom to be able to help you play in front of the next 30 years. And... No, no, I was going to say, to bring it full circle, part of that is like listening to your elders, but also making mistakes for yourself and learning from life, which these athletes, <laughs> bring it full circle, don't really get a chance to do anymore because of social media and cameras and technology. Well, you know what I was going to ask to truly bring it full circle, because gosh, like, you know, an hour flies by, like it's nothing, but uh, it's been just a fantastic time with you all i wasn't even aware i was just like man i love talking to Lindsay and rashad um but it, when we talk about advice talk about getting people with wisdom um i wonder like maybe some examples of that that either of you have like what popped into my head i don't know if necessarily mayweather gave you advice but Lindsay, i was like oh like Lindsay, interview mayweather like that's cool and then i started thinking about okay, what are some other like cool experiences that you had, or maybe a run in we're all in the type of business where, you know, you get to meet people and it's really like, I think I mentioned this on another episode, but I did, I'm going to mention it on this one too. Cause it was like, it was a cool experience for me, but like going uh, to the Lakers game the other night and, and meeting Jeannie and like Adam Silver's right there and stuff like that. Um, like those things stick out, you know, like sometimes we, you know, I had, I've had episodes on this where people like, you know, I don't have a problem with name dropping because this isn't, it's not like we're like, it's like social currency. It's not like I'm trying to like, we're out tr trying to out cloud each other or something. It's more like, I think it's very fascinating because like, there's a lot of like brilliant minds out here. There's people who you admire, broadcasters who you look up to and like, you know, Rashad, what you said, how people think. And so I think when you get to come across special people and maybe you have an interaction where you learn something from them, you work together, you had a conversation at an event and they dropped the gym on you. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, any, any cool experiences you all have had like that uh, work or personal or otherwise. Ooh, for me, it's always been, I've learned more from people's actions than advice I've been given. I've just, learned by observing people and the way they live their lives. And that's like in a work context, 
uh, people I've worked around. Kobe Bryant was one of those that I was fortunate enough to work with several times. And please tell us, I'm I'm not going to let you go further. Uh, like, please tell us a Kobe story just because like, it's like Mamba mentality. Like it's so like everyone has learned something from him. We had yeah. um, Anthony Katz who founded Hyper Ice and was like neighbors with Kobe on here episodes oh. ago. But he had the best stories. He had a story about when they got to Vegas for the 2012 Olympics. Because you saw the Redeem Team documentary just made all the stuff he would do um, when they went clubbing. And then they came back at 5 in the morning. He was up eating breakfast, going to practice. That just was a popular story. But then in 2012, Anthony told us, like, yeah, Kobe got there. Same story. Everybody's all young and messing around. And he went on a on like a 30 mile bike ride in the desert just to like (laughs) but show people that he's not playing around and it was like legend among all the young you know lebron and all them like did you hear about kobe he's out riding in the desert so i'm like Lindsay, you worked with him a few times like please like enlighten us he was one of those people that the team his energy and presence made people straighten up and be on their A game. Like when he would come in, he was definitely the leader. He ran the show. Uh, I worked with him. The times that come to mind especially were when I was writing for ESPN, the magazine, and I we were all in New Orleans. And everyone would be hanging out in downstairs in the lobby of the hotel. And the second Kobe would come out of the elevator, like all the young guys on the team would like straighten up and – Kobe just ran ran the show, but the story, since I have to tell one story, the, my favorite story of all is that he genuinely took interest in getting to know members of the media and uh, fellow beat writers and everyone I'm sure that you talk to will have a different story if they've worked with Kobe. But for me, my favorite memory of him was when I was a sideline reporter for the Blazers this was after I had worked for ESP in the magazine and had, had been around him and worked with him. Um, I was working for the Portland trailblazers and the Lakers were in town playing the blazers and it was halftime and all the other guys ran off and were focused and went into the locker room. And Kobe came up to me and came up to uh, another writer and asked us like how our families were doing. And he wasn't in a hurry to, to get off the the court and to go into the locker room he was actually taking time and genuinely interested in like hey how's your dad doing hey how's how's your mom and to me that that said a lot that he had that that work-life balance and that overall picture that it's bigger than it's, it's not just about the game it's about life is so much bigger than that yeah that's amazing um it seemed like he was either working hard or he was trying to learn um, you know, incredible. Always, always love hearing Kobe stories. Rashad, um, what about you? You played in the league too. So it's like, you know, your peers were amazing athletes, you know, like, like all the great quarterbacks of our generation, you know, you played against them. You, I, I'd love to, whether it's NFL or otherwise, just, uh, I don't know if there's a version of that for you that sticks out, especially when you say I'm a person who likes to think, you know, learn about how people think. I'm sure you were always like really conscious, really like, you know, present um, when you would have special moments. Oh yeah. I've, I've, I've always like been, you know, well, one, just with all the athletes I've been able to play with. um, I think one of note, that's just cool. What I was able to witness was Odell Beckham Jr. Becoming a rock star overnight. Like I witnessed it. I was on the team when he had that, one-handed catch and literally locker beside him and Eli Manning. And remember watching his uh, viewership go up from 600,000 followers, get out of meetings, a million followers, get out of another meetings, two million. Like I wa- overnight, I watched him become a celebrity. And like taking in that moment of, of thinking, why? Like why are people so drawn to, let me see what he's doing, right? Versus other athletes. Um, you know, and it was his personality, it's his charisma, his attitude, his his uh his style, his flavor, right? Um, and his gameplay. Obviously, it's not just solely his gameplay. There's other players that are more outstanding than than him at that position. 
that's played in the history of the game, but they didn't play in this yeah. moment, right? And so what I recognize from that is just like it, he 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 can he like aided in in it the idea of you know being in the right place at the right time, right? And that only comes from doing the work behind the scenes that nobody can see. One thing about Odell, nobody knows. Well, everybody kind of does know. He just doesn't get enough credit for it. Dude was a workaholic. Dude was a workaholic, man. Um, right, you're next to him in the locker room, like, so you know. Yeah. Yeah, I, re- I remember one of the first things about him when he was injured. He he came in the league, he was injured, and uh, he didn't play the first four games. And I remember getting with him. He he, he would come out, like, yo, teach me how to kind of, like, take care of my body. And uh, he would come out and do the warm-up with me every day because I went outside before every practice, did a warm-up, had a little routine. He would come every single day and do it. Um, and you know, started introducing him to other things, eating all these look like I watched him buy into. I'm here to be great intentionally. Like it wasn't a facade. It wasn't a. I'm gonna just get this one catch and I'm done. Like he literally was addicted to working, um, and having fun with it. And that was just a reminder to me. Now, who he is as a person, that's it. But I'm just looking at just straight his ethics of work. It reminds me and it enabled me. He never said this to me, but it just was proof of like, Lindsay, I watch what you do. People that work diligently, daily, consistently, methodically at an art or a craft will grow. Now, your outcome, I don't know. But from that is something that I take is learn to fall in love with the process more than the outcome and you may supersede your original goal. Mm-hmm. Learn to fall in love with the process more than the outcomes. You may supersede your original goal. And I'm sure Odell superseded many. I, um, I'm going to keep it real. I, you said the quote, it was so profound. I was like, you know, that's like a mic drop. Like that might be where we, where we end this conversation. People could take that home. You know, I will Lindsay, you could um, learn, love the process of vacation, honeymoon. Uh, more of course, than I love outcome. that process. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't love the process of their honeymoon? <laughs> yes, exactly. So amazing. Um, it's been really great to just sit down with you all, get to know you a little bit more, you know, talk about this crazy game we're all in. And uh, I'd say more than that, though, just like as people talking about life, like, you know, I, I appreciate you coming and just being like real, being open. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. hundred percent. Appreciate you having us. Absolutely, man. For sure. Keep doing what you're right. doing. Definitely. You, you the same. All right. Um, best of luck. And I'm sure it won't be the last time we cross paths. That's a wrap on another episode of My Other Passion. Thank you, Rashad and Lindsay, for coming out. Definitely wishing both of you the best of luck with all your future endeavors. Appreciate you listening. Holler at me, Ernest Baker, on Twitter if you want to have another conversation. Follow up about anything that you've heard in any of these episodes. And make sure you're listening to the lead off in the newsroom, other podcasts from Front Office Sports. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you soon. <laughs>